So up to this point, we've had a pretty whirlwind tour of all the anemias. We started off by talking about the different type of cells in the blood and discussing how they develop in the bone marrow. We next moved to talking about hemoglobin and the different hemoglobinopathies and how this results in hemolysis and hemolytic anemia. We then talked about the microcytic anemias, including iron deficiency, anemia of chronic disease, and thalassemia. And in the video just before this, we talked about the macrocytic anemias, which are mainly caused by deficiencies of vitamin B12 and folic acid. Now in this video, we're going to be putting it all together, trying to figure out how we can diagnose a patient who presents with anemia, and trying to decide if it's a hemolytic anemia, microcytic anemia, or a macrocytic anemia. Now the best way to do that is just to go back to our handy dandy flowchart, the one we've been using for a number of videos now, to remind us of the mechanism behind hemolytic anemia, or the microcytic and macrocytic anemias, and I'll just use little m slash big M with an A next to it to denote microcytic and macrocytic anemias respectively. Now we know in the hemolytic anemias this is due to increased removal, and this gives us a drop in RBCs. And we know that the microcytic and macrocytic anemias are due to a change, which we know is really a drop in production, and this gives us our decrease in RBCs. And we know that both of them have a decrease in RBCs because that would be our definition of anemia. If you're ever working up a case and get confused as to what type of anemia you're dealing with, you can always come back to this flowchart. And if you figure out you have increased removal or decreased production, that'll help you a lot in terms of figuring out what type of anemia you're actually dealing with. So let's say we have a patient who's denoted by this stick figure right here, and they come to you, and you're able to diagnose them with an anemia. But now the question is what kind? So what do you do to figure out if it's a microcytic anemia, a macrocytic anemia, or a hemolytic anemia? And the best tool we have is really to look at the reticulocytes in the blood. So let's just go ahead and draw an arrow indicating looking at, and we'll say reticulocytes, because this is going to help determine what type of anemia we're dealing with. If you remember, reticulocytes are the slightly immature form of a red blood cell, and normally they're about 1% of the total circulating RBCs. So if we have less of them or more of them, it can help indicate what type of shape our bone marrow is in, and if you're overproducing or underproducing the amount of cells. So there's really only two options here when it comes to our level of reticulocytes. We can either have a decrease in reticulocytes, or we can have an increase in, it, in reticulocytes. Now, a decrease is going to indicate either a microcytic or a macrocytic anemia, while an increase in reticulocytes is going to give us a hemolytic anemia. So let's first take a look at the microcytic and macrocytic anemias first, and we'll start off by talking about the mechanism for the decrease in reticulocytes. So the question here is why? Why do we get a decrease in reticulocytes? Now we know that in the microcytic and macrocytic anemias, we have problems in either DNA or hemoglobin production, and because these are critical components of these cells, this leads to bad production of cells. Now because these are so critical, the cells can't develop as they normally would, so we have a decrease in cell production. And because reticulocytes are a type of cell, in that they'll develop into RBCs, we get a drop in reticulocytes. Well, let's look at this schematic of a red blood cell, and we'll figure it out. On the right side here, we have the macrocytic, so I'll put a big M to denote that, and on the left here, we have a microcytic RBC, so we'll put a little tiny m to denote that. Now on the macrocytic side, this is because we have a drop in DNA production. Because these cells stay in G2 so long, they don't actually enter the M phase until they're huge, and this leads to really big cells. So what can cause a macrocytic anemia? Well, there's really only two causes, and it's deficiencies in either B12 or folate. In both of these cases, the presence of a hypersegmented poly is enough to diagnose a patient with macrocytic anemia. The microcytic anemias, on the other hand, are a little bit different. These are caused by decreased hemoglobin synthesis, and because hemoglobin takes up a significant amount of space inside the RBC, if we're not making hemoglobin as normal, these cells are going to be really small, and there's going to be less of them. Now, the major cause of microcytic anemias is an iron deficiency. So I'll just say decreased in iron. But there are other causes as well. You can have anemia of chronic disease, which is basically a functional iron deficiency where the body is trying to hide iron from organisms such as bacteria that might want it. This could also be due to one of the hemoglobinopathies, thalassemia, which causes defective hemoglobin to be produced. And there's some other less common causes as well like lead or heavy metal toxicity 
or the sideroblastic anemias, which is where hemoglobin is stored inside the mitochondria, where it's unable to be used in its normal capacity. Now, it's easy to tell macrocytic versus microcytic when you're looking this close at an RBC, but in the real world, we'll use the MCV. And on the macrocytic side, that's going to be a measurement of greater than 100 femtoliters. And on the microcytic side, that's going to be less than 80 femtoliters. So now that we've gotten a good look at the macrocytic and microcytic anemias, let's take a look at the hemolytic anemias. So again, we're going to want to answer the same question. Only now, it's why do we have an increase in reticulocytes? In all of the hemolytic anemias, the process starts with RBC damage, and this could be for a number of reasons, which we'll go through in just a second. But this RBC damage leads to hemolysis, and this hemolysis is what causes our hemolytic anemia. In response to this hemolysis, or this drop in red blood cells, we have a compensatory reaction. We have erythroid hyperplasia, which is an increase in RBC precursors in the bone marrow. But because these precursors can't be produced fast enough to keep up with the destruction of RBCs, we end up with hemolytic anemia. So what causes hemolytic anemia? Well, there's a number of causes divided into two categories, but let's take a look at them by examining this RBC. The first set of causes are intrinsic, and we'll go ahead and discuss them here inside the RBC because they're properties of the RBCs themselves that are deficient. And just to help you remember, all of these intrinsic causes of hemolytic anemia end in apathies. So there's three main kinds of apathies. The first is the hemoglobin apathies, and this includes sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. There's the enzymopathies, and this is due to something like G6PD deficiency. Or there's the membranopathies, and this can be hereditary spherocytosis or hereditary elliptocytosis. And all of these cause hemolytic anemia because they predispose this red blood cell to being prematurely removed. The other set of causes of hemolytic anemia are the extrinsic causes, and there's a couple more of these. There's immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, which attacks certain antigens on the red blood cell surface with antibody and predisposes them to being removed from circulation by the immune system. There's the clotting disorders, like DIC and TTP, which both cause the shearing of red blood cells to form schistocytes. There could be other extrinsic causes, infectious diseases, like malaria, for instance, which can predispose these red blood cells to destruction because they're invaded by the parasite that causes malaria. There's something called fetal RH incompatibility, which I'll just abbreviate like so. And this is due to the fact that you have an RH negative mother and an RH positive fetus, and a subsequent RH-positive fetus is going to be potentially attacked by the mother's immune system, though fortunately this can be blocked with the drug Rogam. And the last one is due to transfusions. And interestingly to transfusions, the patient's blood cells aren't being attacked, it's the new blood cells that are being transfused in that are being attacked. But because they're inside this one person's body, we call it a hemolytic anemia because the red blood cells are going to be destroyed. Now another way of looking at all these causes is whether they're immune-mediated or not. And I'll just put a little green triangle to denote causes that are immune. So immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, along with fetal RH incompatibility, and transfusion-mediated hemolytic anemia are the only three causes that have to do with the immune system. The rest of the causes are not immune-mediated, but you can divide them into extrinsic and intrinsic causes if you so wish. So we've now had a quick review of the causes of both hemolytic anemia and macrocytic and microcytic anemia as well as how they cause an increase or a decrease in reticulocytes, respectively. By remembering these changes, as well as remembering the changes in production and the changes in removal that lead to these different types of anemia, you should have no problem diagnosing these when you see them on the wards.